Hey, my name is Pastor Sunil, and welcome to our archive messages. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. in person, or catch us live online. We hope that you're truly blessed by this message, and once again, thanks for tuning in. Amen. Well, it's good to be back, Faith. I was away last week, if I didn't recognize that. Pastor Dave did a great job of starting off our series series on transformed. We, um, we sing uh, and we talk and we read word about how the power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, and yet we sometimes live short of manifesting and letting that power work through us. And so this series, Transformed, is just a practical series on some of the things in our life that we could probably um, see some of God's power transform us. We started last week about uh, our mouths, having transformed mouths. And, uh, and then this week we're going to talk about uh, being transformed in the way we are mad. The, uh, last week I had a chance to watch online and stream it and heard Nathan, Nathaniel Ram share his God story, excellent God story, just about the difference in God's. And, and I've watched and seen the difference in, in Nathaniel's life and God's been doing a work in his life. And, and the reason simply is this, is because he's just submitting himself to God. And, and when you submit yourself to God, he's a creator. He hasn't stopped creating. You, you are being made into a new creation. He hasn't stopped being a creator and giving life. It's just that, that when we come to him, sometimes we come to him and then we, we, we shut him out of areas of our life. And we wonder why we, we have life that is a hindered life. We need, I can encourage you today, before we go any farther, to open up, I encourage you to open up your heart and your mind to him, to receive from him today, because the work that he's doing in your life and the change he's bringing about is a change that's amazing, excellent, perfect work that he's doing in your life. Let me read some background scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, and that's where if you want to turn, I encourage you to bring your Bibles and turn there today. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's talking a little bit about the way things were, and he says, however, that is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Pastor David talked about this earlier about repenting, changing your mind, and put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. When the Lord saved us, he changed us, and he made us new. When the Lord saved you, he changed you, and he made you new. Those who are committed followers of Christ, it's expected that they will be different. Now turn to the person beside you and tell them, you are different. Some of you are saying that with a lot of conviction. It's amazing personalities. Some people hear that and they go, you bet I'm different. I'm like, what? I'm different? Oh no. Like, what do I need to do? Do I need to put on plaid? Or like, what do I, how do I, how do I blend in? You were made new creature. That moment, everything changed. That which was, was the old has become new. It is like, it is like Birth. That's why, got, unless someone would be born again, you know that. Now, how many knew, you remember that, you know, when you have the baby come into your life for the first time, Pastor Sunil has gone out west to visit family and uh, see his brother graduation. This is the first time traveling with a newborn. Oh my goodness, the talk in the office the last few weeks has been incredible. How to, how to successfully travel four and a half hours in a plane with a newborn and and you know where? How do you? How far can you take the pastor call? And, and, and him, we're sharing some great mater, paternal. Um, no one got that miss slip, but uh, uh, you know how? What do you think is the best time? When should the baby feed? What about the rest? What time's your flight? I mean, they're working. Well, it's because it's everything's brand new. I mean, we're flying with with a newborn. And how many remember the time? The first time you drove. I remember the first time we drove. I mean, we had Davis. And I'm thinking, like, little did I know, I mean, he could take a beating. You watch him play hockey and lacrosse, I mean, you can throw him around, he can take it. But at the time, I'm thinking, this little thing, I mean, it can break. So we're 
We're driving. I've never drove more slow in my life. It's the first time driving. With Everything has changed. I mean, it's a big game changer as soon as you introduce this little life. Now, how much more is when, when we come to Christ, we submit our life to him, the Bible says that God makes us new, makes us into a new creature, a new person, so new that you could almost give us a new name. It is things have changed the way we see things, the way we understand things, the way we process things, what motivates us. Now, don't get me wrong. There is still the old way of life that is creeping in. Can you imagine if you, you had an old way of living and all of a sudden everything changed, but you go back to your old apartment and the posters are still on the wall, right? Your, your playlist is still the same playlist on Spotify. Your things in your life are still the way they were before you were made new. And so there's a process where you're now a different person, but there are some things that in your life you've got to put away. Now, I'm not, I'm not going into specifics here today, but you can imagine the image. So Paul's trying to say, hey, listen, you are now a new person, but there are all these things in your life that was like the old person, the old you, and we need to change those things. We talked about the first one last week in verses 25 and 29 about our mouths, things we say, speaking truth, words of life, and today we're going to speak about transformed and the way we are mad and then at the conclusion of the service, and the one thing that I've been thinking about the most for this message in the service today is the conclusion. And that is, and I'm not, not trying to be in a way, but I want to prepare you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to confess sins at the end of the service. Now that sounds like a heavy, I know that. Um, but I'm giving you a heads up on it. And just if there's an area of your life that you know that, uh, that you need to submit to God, an area of your life that's more like the old you instead of like the new you that he has made you to be, if you've been slipping back into some of that stuff, then today I believe God wants to, to set you free. Transformed way we are mad. Have you ever heard the phrase, um, see red? Have you ever heard that phrase? You know, when, when someone gets angry, it's interesting that anger has the, the color red. And it also so happens to be the color of romance, right? You give red roses. I mean, I'm not sure why that is. You can get red in the face because you're blushing. You can also get red in the face because you're ready to poke somebody. You get roses. I mean, is it at all about blossoms or is it also about, also about the thorns? It's interesting. Now this verse I'm going to read in Ephesians chapter 4, 26, and we're going to break it down. Just a couple of verses we're going to grab, 26 and the beginning of 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now it's pretty clear. It's kind of bang, bang, bang. So we're going to kind of go through it that way. First of all, this is a direct quote from Psalm 4, David. Psalm 4 and 4. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Now, if I were to read, earlier I read the NIV. I'm going to read the NASB. Listen to this. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. You see... What the NSAB covers, and, and some translation cover, but it's hard to reconcile, and, and the writers in the NIV try to clean it up a little bit, is that in the original, it literally is in the imperative mood, which means a command. The writer is saying, be angry. Now, well, that's a little bit tough to swallow, so they try to fix it up sometimes in translations, but I'm not going to try to fix it up today. I'm just going to give you the way it is. He is saying... Be angry. It's a positive command. It has this deep-seated determination and conviction. It has that kind of to be red-faced, a person with clenched fist, a person with determination. Now, anger is an emotion. It can be good and it can be bad depending on motives. Let me just say, not all anger is wrong. However, if we're commanded to be angry, it must mean there is something good that should inspire our wrath. Now let me be clear, and some of you, I'm going to ease some of you in, I'm giving a warning to some, some of you other, if you have an issue with anger and you're reading this part and saying, see, there can be good anger, watch out because the other stuff's coming and that's, that's going to get you side the head, that other stuff. But, so if you're looking for this first point to kind of justify your anger outbursts, you're going to be heading for trouble. But the fact is, there is a good anger. There is a good anger. And if it is a good anger, then obviously... Good should inspire the wrath. 
Jesus was angry, and oftentimes we hear God and angry at things in Scripture. It's a far cry from a meek, mild, soft-spoken, wimpy Jesus that some people try to portray. I mean, he took some stuff on. Had no problem taking it on. I think of the time when, when uh, the Pharisees were frustrated and, and were resenting a, a man being healed with a withered hand on the Sabbath. You get a, you get a sense where Jesus kind of goes off with them. He says, are you kidding me? Really? You're more concerned about the fact we carry this stupid little law of yours than the fact that this man has a withered hand that's whole? Are you serious? You get a, he like gets in their face a little bit. And you, you can kind of look at other ones, of course, when uh, the, those were turning worship into a way to make money and, and merchandising and, and turning the house of God instead of a house of prayer into a house of being able to oppress those who are already oppressed. True worship, any time when God is misaligned or misrepresented or worshiping him is twisted, you get a sense to where, where there is a, a response that is strong that comes from God. Jesus took on hypocrisy and false religion. He took especially on those people who were oppressors, who would, would lord over people who were, were down and out and marginalized. He would, would intervene, step in the way, and take on those to get them to back off those who were vulnerable. You get the impression that there were some things that stirred him, that got him fired up. Now, there are things that should make us angry. When I think of this today, I think, so what are the things that, that should maybe stir us up? I'll tell you there's a few things that stir me up. There's some things that stir me up when I listen to the news, when I watch them, but nothing stirs me up more than the things I witness personally. When I see marriages being destroyed because of just the enemy having a foothold in there, that starts to stir me up. When I see the effect that some things have on our youth and some things have on generations, when I see innocent people dying because of, because of those who are oppressing them, when I see people terrorizing people who are vulnerable, that starts to get me stirred up. When I see weak and poor and less fortunate people being accused and put the thumbs on them and putting them down, or when I see injustice, or when I see assaults on, on God or God's word, those things start to get me fired up. The truth is, anger can be fired up by either hell or can be fired up from the altar of God. Now, when it's fired up by hell, it's hell that happens. And when it's fired up by the altar of God, it's about things that are about bringing God glory. So this is a very careful kind of distinction, but I, I think their reason, and the best description I can give you is to quote, because smart people you quote. And so I'm gonna, this guy has a doctor in front of his name, Dr. David Siemens, so this is a smart person. But especially when I read this quote, I thought this is the best way to describe why should there be a good anger? Here's why. Anger is divinely implanted emotion, he says. Closely allied to our instinct for right, it is designed to be used for constructive spiritual purposes. The person who cannot feel anger at evil is a person who lacks enthusiasm for good. If you cannot hate wrong, it's very questionable whether you really love righteousness. Isn't that a good way to put it? I mean, there's some things that should get us fired up. There's some things that should just really rub us the wrong way. It's the right kind of anger. And the right kind of anger is wholesome, healthy, constructive, and godly. Okay, so that one's done. Now we get into the other stuff. We've got the imperative. Now the improper. In your anger, or be angry, but do not sin. Well, now we get in the middle of it. The problem is most of our anger is the wrong kind of anger. We are rarely angry at the right people about the right things at the right moment, the right ways, for the right reasons, for the right amount of time. We usually get all of those rights wrong or most of them. We're angry at the wrong person at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. We have the wrong motives behind our anger. Be angry, but don't sin. The truth of the matter is we have a hard time controlling our anger. Most of the time, our anger is selfish. We're hurt. We're offended. We're slighted. And then what happens is things turn on us and how we feel. And sinful anger is self-serving and, and defensive. And it leads eventually to a hateful spirit 
the difference between good anger and bad anger is the focus of the anger. So let me give you kind of in a form of a rule of a thumb or a litmus test. Rule of thumb. If what you're angry about directly affects you, how you feel, what you think, what someone said to you, or what they didn't do that you asked them to, then it is likely sinful anger. It's likely counterproductive anger. Harm done to God or others, that, a righteous anger. Here's a litmus test. Ask yourself, am I angry because of how this affects me? Or does my anger exist because of what and how others or God is affected by this? Another guy, this guy doesn't have a doctor, but he's got a German-sounding name, and usually those are good people to quote. Frederick Buchner. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is probably the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontations still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back, in many ways it is a feast for a king. The chief drawback is what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at your feast is you. So anger becomes sin. When? Anger becomes sin when it's about self. Anger becomes sin when it is allowed to grow into resentment and results in outbursts. It's sin when it plots the downfall of another person. This is a way you know for sure something's wrong. It says, we should not rejoice in the folly of another. You know, it's, I call it the Nellie Olson principle. Some of you, that's probably way over your head, but it's making a rise now on Netflix. You know, it's when Nellie Olson trips and falls in the mud in her really prissy white dress, and you all kind of go, yeah. Or when that, that bad guy in the movie that's been a lippy and just driving everybody crazy and finally gets what's coming to him, and you're like, yeah. And gets it. Or when, when the guy that passed you and cut you off gets pulled over, and you see him on the side of the road, you go, ha, 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 right? I know, we've all had those moments. I had that one just not too long. I guess it was coming back from, uh, we were in the States, and I saw this very exact thing happen. So that guy's going to get a ticket. And then he gets a ticket, and I, I was not being prophetic. I was being uh, problematic is what the issue was for me. But when we had that desire to say, you know what, hopefully they get what's coming to them. That's that, that seed of destruction. I'm going to get more of that in a, in a few moments, but God is not someone who brings about and rejoices in evil. And if so if our attitude is, is rejoicing in folly and failure and evil and pain, there is one source of that stuff, and it's not a good source. We need to remove ourselves from this stuff. When we become a new creature, we become like Christ, these things need to be put away in our lives. It stifles our worship. It hinders our, 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 our faithfulness to God. And it consumes us, and it's all we can think about. How do we respond to it? These things that undermine our joy affect our ability to continue on. I, uh, I'm a bit of a basketball nut, and I, I like especially the old school basketball. Larry Bird was one of my favorites. But there was a guy, an old basketball player for the Knicks, Walt Fraser. And uh, he was playing against the Bullets in a playoff game there a while ago. And um, in the game, it was heated. And you see that right now, a lot of playoff stuff going on in uh, both basketball and, and hockey. And it got a little bit heated. There's another guy that was trying to, you know, obviously get in his way, hold him back. And, and so far, the Bullets were winning. And this, this tactic was kind of, uh, of, of being aggression on their best player, Walt Fraser, was successful. However, it went and crossed the line. And this, this bullet player, I don't remember the guy, but I remember it, it's uh, now you see them often on YouTube. But uh, he, he, in the middle of the whistle went, he turned, and he, and he punched Walt Fraser. Walt Fraser never even responded. I mean, you couldn't even tell by the look on his face. It was like Holtby when they put like five goals in him last night. I mean, it was just like, he just was, you couldn't even tell that he was upset or nothing. He just got blindsided. Walt Fraser just nothing. Foul was called. 
while Fraser hits the shots. After that, he hits seven straight baskets and the Knicks won. Now, I, I know it's, you know it's not the big God in the illustration, but I couldn't help it, and I don't even... I, Anyways, I won't even go there. I'm not going to conjecture on whether Walt Fraser was a believer or not. I have no idea. But I was just on, the, on his response because I've seen many different responses to that kind of anger where the person pokes you and the person reacts and the retaliation one that get the penalty or that gets a person off their game because all they can think about is how to get that person back again and now they can skate right by the puck to try to hit the guy when the puck was right there. And all of a sudden, your ability to function is, is affected. I've seen many people outside of a sports analogy, but in a life analogy, they can ruin, walk away from an opportunity, sabotage their, their provisions, all because all they can think about is this person. All they could think about was that problem, the thing that was said, that thing that was done. So, be angry, but don't sin. Now here there's another command. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Imminent. Anger that's allowed to simmer quickly chokes out life, peace, joy out of you and everyone around you. Don't let the sun go down. The command is very clear. Get a handle on your anger and get a handle on it quick. Do not let your anger simmer. We think counting to 10, counting to 100, counting to 1,000. You think that's going to help. But that does not help if you do not resolve it. Putting a lid on something that's infected is going to make it more infectious. Covering a wound without repairing it or healing it is only going to make it more red. The last phrase, don't let the sun go down. Anger that's allowed to simmer turns to resentment. Resentment eventually turns to bitterness. And bitterness results in self-righteousness, a condition that chokes out life and joy. So, it should be noted, anger, resentment, bitterness, they're also contagious. Let me speak first of all, this is bitterness. And I've said this before, but I'm going to, another reminder. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, anger, or the source, whatever a hurt was, see, We are hurt by something that was said or something that was done, but far more damage happens when when we lash out in anger, we seek revenge, we're unforgiving, we, we are bitter. Far more injury happens there. We continue to allow that one act to destroy us. We must quickly, quickly deal with that wound. Forgiveness. See, the problem is this. We typically, when we're angry, we want to get back at the person. They say something, we want to say something back, we'll gossip, we'll enlist, we'll figure out a way to how to try to somebody make them pay for that. The problem is bitterness and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. That's what it is. You, you think about these things. Every time you see them, it goes across your mind. You drive by that place. You think about them again. And you got all these thoughts of what you're going to do and things, how you're going to get back at them. And, and, and so you, you see them and you don't talk to them. And, and you see them and you, you, you talk with some friends and you ignore those friends too because those friends were friends with them. And you, they talked to them. And now I'm not even going to talk to them or I'm not going to talk to them. And you start thinking of all these ways. And all you are doing is you're hindering yourself. All you're doing is causing more pain and more grief, eating yourself away. You are drinking poison, expecting your enemy to suffer. It's time to stop drinking the poison. Trouble is this. Anger can, and I wasn't going to get into this, but when we do pre-marriage class, I talk with couples about an anger can. An anger can is like when something happens and it's like we shake and then, you know, we're late for work and it shakes and the guy cuts us off and we shake in the anger can again and... And then, you know, a boss yells at us, you're shaking the anger can, and we lose a job, and we shake the anger can, and then we get asked to do overtime, and we didn't have the time, and shake the anger can. And, and by the time you get home, you, you, your anger can's been shaken all day like a two-liter bottle of Coke, and, 
And then all of a sudden, someone goes, oh, well, I'm thirsty. Goes to open up and out it comes. It's not the person that shook the can all day. Life shook the can, but the people that are closest to the people with the can, they're the one that get covered in the anger acid. That's what usually happens. And then what happens, once they get covered, what are you mad at me for? Boof, off they go, their anger can. And what happens is you create this contagious, this, it's almost epidemic of, of anger and resentment and bitterness that becomes contagious and it spreads. It's a snare of death. There was a man told by a physician, and perhaps you've heard this, I've said this before, it was a long time ago, but I, I, I think of it every time when I, I think of anger and resentment. Doctor uh, was, did some studies on him, blood tests, and says, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I know what's happened is, is you've been, you must have been bitten by an animal, and what you've got is you've got rabies. That's what's causing your discomfort and your pain right now. And so immediately the man pulled out a pad and a pencil and a pad of paper and started furiously writing down. And the doctor's like, no, you don't need to panic. It's, it's not like life and death. There's a cure. We can treat this. Uh, he goes, I know that. I'm just writing a list of people I'm going to bite. <laughs> Truth about it is, if we don't deal with our anger, it'll destroy us. Practical illustration, I read this and I uh, wanted to relate it with you. It's uh, Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War, Edmund Stanton. Now they call it a Secretary of Defense. Well, in some countries, maybe it's more like a Secretary of War. But um, Stanton... Is, uh, was Abraham Lincoln's secretary of, of war and was, was angered at one of his army officers who was plotting against him and would accuse him of favoritism. And so Stanton took that as a personal attack on himself and he was pretty upset. He came to Lincoln about this and Lincoln said, I suggest you write that officer a sharp letter. So Stanton did. He wrote a doozy, a strong letter. And then after he brought the letter and he showed it to the president, the president said, now what are you going to do with it? Stanton said, send it. Lincoln shook his head. You don't want to send that letter. Then he took the letter from him and threw it in the stove. So that's what I do when I've written a letter when I'm angry. It's about all it's good for. He said, now, I can say it's a good letter. You probably enjoyed writing it. It was well written. You probably felt better after you wrote it. But that's about all the good that will come out of that letter. He said, now, sit down and write another one. That's what Lincoln used to do. Write the first letter, the first response. It usually has all that carnal stuff in there. Get that out, put it aside, and then we'll write a second letter. Why? But you want to be careful about spreading death, influence. And this is where we get to the really climax of the, whole seri- of the whole text. In your anger, or be angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Any case of anger, legitimate or not, if it's allowed to run to a full, ultimate conclusion, permits the enemy to have the upper hand in our lives. Let me read another word from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Anyone you forgive, I forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes." So the reason why you don't want to let anger last or simmer and turn to bitterness and resentment is because you don't want to give way to the enemy. You don't want to give him a beachhead, some ground. You don't want to let him rent a room in your house. You don't want to make a place for him at your table. You don't want to give him a primary seat in your car. You want to make sure that he is locked out. What are the schemes of the enemy? Well, we know. He steals, kills, and destroys. We know that he prowls. 
We know that he loves to ambush. The problem is, we know this. We know there is an enemy who is seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, who's prowling and just looking for a doorway and an opportunity to jump. And we leave doors wide open. Well, that's not a whole lot of city sense, is it? We leave things wide open, saying, here you go. It would be like the shepherd, seeing the wolves, knowing them, hearing them. Ooh, and, and what do they do? They just, here, let me open the gate for you. I know there's a spot here they can get in, but, eh. I mean, how foolish. If you know there is one who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, for goodness sake, close the gaps. Do not allow him entrance. And if he gets in, you chase him out and you block the gap. We often throw the door open when we refuse to let go of, whole, of old wounds. We refuse to acknowledge our own wrongs. We open a door to him when we don't forgive. We open a door for him when we judge others. We open a door when we, we cannot get ourselves to say, I'm sorry. We open a door when we refuse to lay down our rights. Unreconciled anger in our heart gives him just the opening he needs to attack us and then attack others through us. I'll say that one again because it is so true. When we don't deal with our anger, our bitterness, and our hurts, we open an area of our life up to letting him attack us and allowing him to attack others through us. We leave a marked off place. It is even more than just leaving a vulnerable place in our lives for him to come in. It is as if we post a sign saying, enemy, enter here. Here's the way in. Let's look at the word, and I want to go into big, huge detail here, but uh, the word devil for a moment. Greek word diabolos, diabolo. Uh, and I don't get into the Greek a lot, but uh, I can't help but see the word, the prefix dia. It means through. It has and gives the connotation of, of right in it, penetration. Someone who is a, an enemy who is able to, to get past the fortification, to, to get into the area that is vulnerable, to get past, past the wall, the devil. We've already been looking at a way that he's trying to get an entry point. We looked last week. Words can be an entry point for the enemy. To slip into people's lives, their mind and emotions. The enemy's job is to separate, to accuse, to bring death and destruction. When we hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness, we feed anger, self-pity, self-righteousness, and this is it. You'll know the, the accuser has gone to work in your mind when your whole perspective changes. Who are you like? Are you like the one that we sing about who is forgiving and merciful and kind and loving and compassionate? Or you are accusing and judging and, and, and unrelenting and impatient? If, if since an event has happened or, or events or or just if you did a, a review of where you are at and a, and a 360, are you accusing? Are you someone who brings about destruction? Are you nitpicky, negative, fault-finding? This person you used to have high regard for, now suddenly you can't see anything good about them. And I know, you can say, but it's because I've lost trust in them because of something they've done or something they've did or they've said that. But now this person that you used to trust or used to be close to you or used to be friends, now because of one event, you're justifying holding them over the flames. I, I'm sorry, but I don't see anywhere in, in Christ's life that he acted such manner. Especially when those individuals are repentant. 
even when they're not repentant and they were crucifying him on the cross, at that moment, he says, Father, forgive them. So you can't tell me and you can't show me in Scripture that there is justification to hold people over the coals when they are doing something wrong and they have been, maybe have been wrong. But what happens is, if you don't deal with that and forgive them, you open up an area of your life to the enemy. You welcome him in and then he starts his accusing work in you and through you. And those people that need forgiveness and need mercy, need patience, they probably know they've messed up. Those people, instead of getting mercy, uh, mercy and patience, it's a patience and mercy together, Percy. Patience and mercy together. <laughs> instead of getting that together from, from you, who someone where they needed to hear from, how meaningful is the word of forgiveness from somebody you know you've wronged? How meaningful are those words? But when we don't, what we get is we get accusation from the people we know we've wronged. This is a powerful word, people, and I know it's strong. I'm going to bring into a close, and just before I close, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a verse of Scripture. I know you probably, some of you are already thinking about, but I'm going to twist it on you a little bit because I think we've interpreted it wrongly. Evidence that the accuser is at a work and has gained an entry point into your relationship and into your mind is how bent you are on accusing. Don't allow conflict or disagreement to pick up a wrong attitude. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Therefore, I want to make sure I haven't missed my... Okay, good, I haven't forgotten. I'm now all nervous because, I don't know if you remember here, but a couple weeks ago I forgot to invite the worship team up. They were all panicked at me. We didn't hear you. I know, I know, I forgot. So uh, I had to ask for forgiveness of that one. There it fits in. See, I tied it in. So now I'm sitting here all worried. I had to make sure I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. So worship team, don't worry about it. Not just yet. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Listen to the urgency here again. How it's imminent. Don't let this wait. Don't give the enemy a foothold. And how important this is. To Jesus, he says in Matthew chapter 5, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there are... And there, remember, and here's, let me see, okay, uh, I don't want to preach another whole sermon, but hear me just say, there are some times when you're seeking to draw close to, to God, you might be praying, you have your Bible open, you're doing devotions, you hear worship, and as you're drawing close to him, things will come into remembrance. All of a sudden you think of a person, you think of something said, something where you were, something you've done, something in the past. And, and that's not happening by accident. That is the Holy Spirit of God at work in your life. That's what's happening right there. You're not being distracted. You're not having ADD at those moments. That's what that is, is as you're trying to draw close to God, he's saying there's an area of your life that's hindering you in your worship. And so what he does is the Holy Spirit brings that to your memory. Now, he's not doing that to accuse you. That's, that's the enemy. When God brings a, a, a past or a failure or a problem or a difficulty up to your remembrance, he's doing it so you can remove it so you can be unhindered and move forward. That's why he's doing it. And so when you have this, that's what's here. When you're, you come, you worship, and when you are worshiping or when you come to worship and something comes to remembrance, here's the principle in this. You might be thinking, well, I don't know. How, how do I do? You need to deal with it then. And yes, I mean like then. Like then, then. Pick up your phone and text that person like then. Hey, listen, I'm so sorry. I feel bad for what I said last night. Please forgive me. Go to them in the service. In the shaking hand time, shake hands and tell them. I mean then. Then is the time. Now is the moment for obedience. It's not later because when you put it off, you don't do it. It's then at that moment you deal with it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let the service finish. You need to go then. So this is what he says. When this comes to remembrance that your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way or your adversary may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. I read the whole thing to show you how urgent he's saying. And then a lot of the mays at the end. We don't know where it's going to end up. But handle things quickly. 
deal with problems and grievances and conflict quickly. You must have difficult conversations with yourself and those around you rather than allow these things to continue on. We could choose to harbor the bitterness, continue to act in the old way we used to act, or we say to ourselves, no, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to give a place. I'm not renting out a room for the enemy. He doesn't have a place at my table and no spot in my vehicle. That enemy is out, and I'm not even going to let myself go there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this right now. I'm not going to accuse. I'm not going to be an accuser for him. And so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a forgiver. And so what you do is you stop at that moment, you shut the door, you kick him out, and you lock it up. You extend forgiveness, you extend mercy, you extend grace. I'm going to give you a chance to do that in a few moments. Benjamin Franklin said, Anger is never without a reason, but seldom with a good one. If we don't learn to handle it, it'll eventually handle us. I'm going to just give you a couple of Proverbs, and then we're going to close. Listen to these Proverbs. A book of Proverbs is really good. It has a lot, and I put them all in your handout if you want to read them individually. But just a few of them I'll quote. A quick-tempered person does foolish things. So true, eh, Proverbs? Words of wisdom. Don't make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Why? Or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. Be angry, uh, an angry person stirs up conflict, and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. And then he says in Proverbs 15, The one who is patient calms a quarrel. And finally, Proverbs 27, Anger is cruel and fury overwhelming. Satan is a slanderer, an accuser, a destroyer. And when we slander, when we accuse, and we destroy, we do his will instead of the Father's. That's the simple message today. I'm going to have the worship team come up as we're going to close. Our tempers are another area of our life that we must be brought under the Lord's control. If anger or bitterness is allowed to take a place in our life, and it'll cause us to seek and do the will of the enemy rather than the will of the Father. I want to read this verse. I told you I was going to flip something on you. It's this Romans 12 verse, and perhaps you've heard of it. I'm going to read it, and then you'll see as we get towards the end. Do not pay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. How many were thinking of that earlier? How many saw that? Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This heaping coals thing. I know some of you, perhaps you, and I have in the past, maybe, used this to say, well, see, uh, in a way, it's almost like baptized revenge. I'm going to do something good for them, that way I'll burn their head. I'm going to heap coals on their head. They're going to feel guilty. No, see, that is that accuser trying to hurt and harm part of it. I don't believe that's what that scripture means. In this day, when someone would carry things, they would carry things on their head. I mean, I'm in, I've been to Africa many times in, Af in, in missions trips, and uh, I remember seeing a little kid walking to school in bare feet with their shoes on their head. <laughs> and I asked why. Well, because they don't want to wear their shoes out. I mean, they were clean, they were polished, and so they carried their shoes and walked. When they got there, they dusted off their feet and put their shoes on and went into class. It was a, it's another tool to be used to carry things. I remember one time when I was in the village and we were at services on a Friday night and a Saturday night we were showing the Jesus film and the Sunday morning we were having services out right in the village in, in, near, Tuka, in, near, um, in, near the Tanzanian border in, Uganda, in Kenya. And so while we were there overnight, we slept in the pews, which are half-cut logs in the, in the church. I remember waking up in the morning and seeing a group of women coming back from getting water, carrying 
two five-gallon pails of, jug, of water in their hands and one on their head. With the exception were two ladies who were carrying their laundry on their head. Big bowl of laundry. Because why would you like, bring water back and then just do laundry here? You bring the laundry down there, and you do laundry there, and you bring it back again. I saw them carrying, I'm thinking, and then I remember just the night before, they had a little piece of wood on the ground for me behind some bushes, and they had warmed the water on the fire and, and with two basins. And, and for me to have a shower and cool off in the evening was to, and I literally was pouring water over my body and on my head, washing my hair and my hands. And I thought, I probably used five gallons of water. And I realized they had to walk eight kilometers to get that water. And how they used was their head. So when I'm thinking of when someone carries something on their head, that is, that is how they would carry things. In the, in the New Testament as well, as well as today, it was hard for us to realize this when we have all our provisions. But uh, anybody who watches Survivor, you know this, that fire is life. I can't believe I just used Survivor as an illustration here, an altar call, but uh, <laughs> Fire. And so if you were in your home fire, it was what necessary to give warmth and to cook. And, and as they would cook and work this fire, sometimes, however, if you're way too long, it was someone's job or if they would fall asleep. If the fire would go out, what was most important is you would at least have coals to be able to get that fire going. But if you neglected it for too long, you would not have any coals. Your, your flame would be out. You've heard fra- phrases in Scripture were saying breathing and blowing on the coals. In the same phrase... You would, you would have coals to get the fire back going, but at a moment when you've lost not just your fire, but you have no coals, what would you do? You would go to a neighbor's house, and you would ask them for some coals. Now, when they would come, a generous neighbor would not just give you a few coals, but would heap coals. I don't believe this is about cursing. I believe this is about blessing. That if someone is thirsty, you will give them something to drink. And if they're hungry, even if they're your enemy, and even if you would have a reason to be angry with them, you would feed them. And by doing that, it's like heaping on them blessings upon blessings. You win them over, not by returning evil with evil, by somehow making them feel guilty for doing something good for them. No, that's not what that's saying. It's saying, you know what? If someone has hurt you and someone has harmed you, if you have a reason to be angry with somebody, bless them. Not just bless them enough that would be expected, but go beyond what is just a regular blessing. Beyond it, heap blessing on them. By doing that, you're overcoming evil with good. That is the message of the New Testament follower of Christ. Now, I know the problem is, is we have a hard time understanding what repentance is. We focus on our problems, our situations, that thing that was said, and it was great, and it was a big problem, it was a big hurt. But ultimately, we elevate that so big, it becomes greater than our God. We, we hold that thing so close, we, clo- we hold it closer than Him. We treasure our wounds so great, we treasure them greater than our Savior and His promises. If transformation is transformation, then it implies change. If you come to Christ and surrender to him, you will be different. I remember when I was in Bible college, a speaker spoke a word that penetrated my heart. Be the child of God that you already are. You might not be a thief or a murderer. Paul could have used any number of sins when he said, be angry, but don't sin. There could be a number of things that are in that list. The principle is the same. The old me must not be allowed to follow the new me. The old me is gone. This is the new me. So, today I'm not sure what's happened. Perhaps like that scripture in Matthew, you were sitting there and, and something came to remembrance. Something said, person, situation, 
circumstance, a job, an employer, employee. When he is Lord, he will be the Lord of your life, even your anger and your hurts. So there's a book written by Kay Arthur and it says, Lord, heal my hurts. And that's what I want to invite us to do here today. Would you stand with me? Twofold in this response, and really this is the focal point of the, of the whole day. I, I couldn't help but think about this. Number one, because you know, you have people anger management. And people say, you know, I get control of my anger. That is fine, but controlling your anger is like taking a Tylenol for a fever. That's good. I mean, you gotta get the anger down. You don't wanna get too high of a fever. Things get, you know, get delusional. And, and, and lots of things can happen if you get too high of a fever. You wanna get the fever down, that's true. But just getting the fever down isn't the thing. Because you know what's gonna happen after that Tylenol wears off four hours later, it's back. You have to, you have to deal with the infection, the cause. The, the fever is actually just helping you see that something's wrong. When you racked out in an outburst, it's secondary emotion is what anger is. It's only a reaction to what happened first, the fear, the frustration, the, the misunderstanding, the, the hurt, the pain. So I, I want to do, a, first of all, a prayer to say, Lord, heal my hurt. So if you're here today, I'm going to have everyone bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you're here today and you have a hurt, something was said, something was done, I don't know the person, I don't know the name, I don't know how long it happened, but today you have a hurt. And that hurt has been consuming you. It has been, it has been affecting your joy. You've been robbed of joy. You've been robbed of life. You've been robbed of hope and peace. And I want to just ask and have a prayer of healing for hurts today. If that's you, would you raise your hand high so I can see it? Yeah. Yeah, lots of people. You just keep that up. Don't take it down. Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray for those people that are raising their hands right now. The enemy has made a way into these lives through hurts. So, Heavenly Father, first of all, I pray for a healing. I pray, Lord, that you would, like a healing balm, like a salve on top of a wound that's infected, you would spread over those situations, those hurts, that you would erase those words with words of life right now by your Holy Spirit as they would remember those words that were spoken. They would remember the word of God and it would, relate, it would erase those words that caused death. Lord, those things that were done, I'm not sure where or by how, but Lord, today, we stop the cycle of those victimizing this person. We stop now that, that playing over and over again of that affliction. And today, set them on a path of life and joy again. Lord, I pray you would restore joy, restore hope, and restore peace. That you would heal. And this is not something done with a magic set of phrases or words. Some kind of special, special potion but this is just simply turning to you, the one who is the creator who makes all things new, and we bring to you this that has been brought, that has been ravaged by the enemy, but what the enemy has torn down, you will build up. And so Lord, I pray that you will bring new life to these areas. Those relationships have been affected, I pray you'd restore them. I pray, Lord, you restore hope for tomorrow, that you would no longer chain them to past circumstances, and you would no longer have them define their future based on what has happened. But now they will base their future on the God who is able to answer. Hear them when they humble themselves. A God who has plans for them, plans to give them future and a hope, one that is prosperous and with promise. Lord, I pray that you would heal these hurts, matters of the heart, and you would shut out the enemy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanses from all our righteousness. God is a lifter of heads. When you come to him, and I know you've had that moment, I've had that moment, we've all had that moment. When you feel lower than the knee of a grasshopper, because you're thinking, man, I messed up, I said I wasn't gonna do this, and you just feel, you just feel low. A great God doesn't make you feel lower. He lifts your head. And we serve a great God, amen? amen? And so how much more should we be people who are lifting heads? Say, stop, stop. Stop getting down on yourself. Stop putting yourself down. Stop living under that weight. 
That's what would bring Stephen as he's being stoned to say, Father, forgive them. Same way as Savior said. I'm calling us to be a church that radically lives out Christ-like lives. I want to conclude this as we're going to sing. We're going to have you confess. And some of you, you know what? You've got, yes, some things were done to us. But the truth of the matter is, hurt people hurt. I want to give you an opportunity as well to confess the fact that perhaps you've been used by the enemy to cause some hurt, made a mistake, affected some people. You want to admit that today? Raise your hand. I want to pray a prayer to free you from that guilt. The Bible says, and it comes to this, and spiritual renewal hinges on this. You either confess or you cover up. That's the two things. I know you're probably thinking, man, come to church. I heard a lot about sin today. I thought that's not popular. But uh, Proverbs says, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses it and forsakes it will have mercy. The reason why we admit it is because that when we're finally freed from it. So if you're here today, you want to surrender something to Christ, a mistake you've made, you know it's affected people around you, Regardless of the reasons behind it, you just know the enemy was able to cause some harm through something you've done. You want to confess that today and ask for forgiveness. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray a prayer of forgiveness for you. Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you for those that just raised their hand. Lord, I pray you say you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You also not only free us from guilt, but from shame. So Lord, I pray you set them free. We know that, that, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And there are times when he is able to do his work through us because of our own wounds. But today this stops. Today we, we no longer harbor those, those offenses. We confess that in our reaction, we have caused harm. We ask, Lord, you for forgiveness, because especially in those situations where people know that we're children of the King, that we're followers of Christ, and, and we've acted in a way that's honored your name, we ask you for forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to reach out with courage to forgiveness of those we've wronged as well. Restore, build, set free. We want to be people of grace and mercy. We no longer want the enemy to have entry points. We shut him out. Our sin is great, but our God is greater. Our sin is great, but our God is greater. And we know that your grace abounds. We worship you today. We praise you. We thank you. We honor you. And as we sing this song, we lift you up today. We don't look at our past mistakes or failures. We don't look at the failures of others, how they've disappointed us or hurt us. But today we draw our focus on you. We make it all about you. We lift you up. You are great. 